I was walking downtown with a group of friends and there's this man standing on the corner of a busy intersection and he's holding a loudspeaker. He's wearing this giant sign that says, turn or burn. And into the loudspeaker, he's angrily preaching that people immediately repent of their sins or else they would face eternal damnation. Is, is this an effective evangelism strategy? Is this what Jesus had in mind when he told his disciples to go into the world and preach the gospel? As I walked by the man, I, I, I couldn't help but think to myself, what a weirdo. Why is he even doing this? D does he know that he's doing more harm than good? Does he, does he know no one's even listening to him? Does he realize that he's actually working against the cause of Christ? Surely there's got to be a better way. Surely God had a more effective marketing strategy in mind when he uh, commanded his followers to get the good news out to people. Today we're wrapping up a series called How to Be Spiritual Without Being Weird. And so far, we've learned that the biblical goal in life is not to be a spiritual person, but the biblical goal in life is to be a Holy Spirit person. See, being a Holy Spirit person means that we have the indwelling Spirit of God living within us. And when you are a Holy Spirit person, you are living with open hands and an open heart. Now, not only do Holy Spirit people live with open hands and an open heart, but as we're going to discover today, Holy Spirit people live as walking salt shakers. Yeah, salt shakers. Now, I know what you're thinking. Before you go on hating on the lowly salt shaker, salt shakers can be important things. It was Valentine's Day just this past year, and being the romantic that I am, I invited my beautiful, loving wife, Ashley, out for a romantic evening, just the two of us. I made reservations at a fancy restaurant, and I planned to stop and get flowers on my way home from work, to sweep her off her feet, and, and in my grand gesture of love, become husband of the year, year, year. So I told Ashley our plans, and, and it was a date. I'm on my way home, and, and Ashley calls me up, and she says, Simon, in a panic, she goes, we forgot that one of our kids had soccer practice. Kids, am I right? So we cancel our dinner reservations, and we go on a date to the soccer field in the rain. Classic. Now, I still hadn't got Ashley flowers yet, so we swing by the only place that we knew would still have Valentine's Day flowers at this late hour in the day. We go to Costco, obviously. So upon our arrival, we find out that Costco is completely sold out of flowers. So I tell Ashley, Ashley, the sky's the limit. Pick out anything else from Costco and that will be your Valentine's Day present from me. And I start doing the math in my head. And I start thinking, can I afford that new washer dryer set? <laughs> can, can I afford that new couch sectional that Ashley's been eyeing for a few weeks? And she comes back to me with her pick. And out of everything at Costco, she wanted a new salt and pepper shaker. <laughs> so yes, Dr. Romance over here and husband of the year, I got my wife a salt shaker for Valentine's Day. See, salt shakers can be important things, more important than you may originally have thought. Jesus was once preaching this sermon. It was his most famous sermon that he's ever preached. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And as soon as he's done laying out the Beatitudes, like these blessings, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, he then launches into this profound teaching a teaching that tells us as Christ followers, as, as Holy Spirit people, why we are really here. Listen carefully to what Jesus says. He says, let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and you'll end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as, as public as a city on a hill. 
If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. And now that you're there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep an open house. Be generous with your lives. And by opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. I love this. I love that we as Holy Spirit people, this is why we are here. To bring out the God flavors, to bring out the God colors in this world. If you're following along in your outline, we as Holy Spirit people are to be salt and light. We're to be salt and light. One thing I love about salt is salt brings out the flavor in whatever you're eating. Just think of all the yummy food that you eat that you put salt on, right? Hot French fries, salt on there. Some scrambled eggs in the morning with a little salt and pepper on there maybe. Even chocolate chips, good chocolate chips have salt on them. Like if you know, you know, am I right? Salt, it enhances flavors in our food. And we, as Holy Spirit people, are to be the salt that brings out the God flavors in this world. And it's the same with light. Light shines even in the darkest places. You can't hide from light. Light, it illuminates the God colors in this world. So you might be thinking, okay, Simon, what are these God flavors and what are these God colors specifically? What does this even mean, God flavors, God colors? Well, God flavors and God colors, they're God's attributes. They're his nature. They're, they're his character. They're his purest love imaginable. And this is what we, as Holy Spirit people, point people towards. But you might be thinking, okay, Simon, but what happens if we, his Holy Spirit people, what if we choose not to do this? Well, if we, God's Holy Spirit people, choose not to do this, we choose not to be salt, choose not to be light, if we're not bringing out the God flavors and the God colors in this world, then we, essentially, we've lost our saltiness, so to speak. And how will people taste godliness? How will people meet Jesus? If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? Jesus says you've lost your usefulness and you'll end up in the garbage. Jesus' rebuke is quite harsh. If you've lost your saltiness, you've lost your usefulness, and you'll end up in the trash. So don't miss what Jesus is saying here. God's good news is not a secret to be kept. God wants us to take this private relationship and make it public. See, sharing the good news of Jesus, it is foundational to our faith. And it's been this way for thousands of years. And we even have current research that backs this up. So Barna Research recently did a study that revealed almost all practicing Christians believe that part of their faith means being a witness about Jesus. See, and they believe that the best thing that could ever happen to someone is for them to know Jesus. So when it comes to the state of the church today and what Christians foundationally believe about being a witness about Jesus, this is great news. Except there's one little hang up. Barner Research also discovered that almost half of one generational age group thought it was wrong to share their faith. So yeah, we all agree that we as Holy Spirit people need to be a witness about Jesus, but almost half of one generational group thinks, no way, I'm not sharing my personal faith to do it. Do you think you know which generational group it is? Here's a hint. It's the one that ruins everything. It also happens to be the largest one. It's the generational group that I'm a part of. <laughs> Yeah, you guessed it. It's millennials. Those people born from, you know, 1984 to about 1998. So if you're between the ages of 24 and 38 years old. See, Barna Research found that almost half of millennials, 47% of them, agree at least somewhat that it's wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that one day they'll share the same faith. See, this is compared to a little over one quarter of Gen X and one in five boomers and elders. Okay, so what's going on here? What's the difference that millennials are picking up on? 
Why is witnessing about Jesus okay and foundational to our faith as Christ followers, but sharing one's personal beliefs? Mm, that's a little taboo. It's like they're saying, it's okay for us to inform your mind, but it's wrong for us to try to change your mind. See, perhaps too many millennials have had a similar experience to me. When I was walking around downtown and, and ran into that Christian weirdo with the loudspeaker, maybe the idea of trying to change someone's mind is just, it's a little too pushy. It's, it's a little too in your face. It's, it's just plain weird. So that leaves me wondering, okay, Jesus, if, if as a Holy Spirit person, I'm supposed to be salt and light, if as a Holy Spirit person, I'm supposed to bring out the God flavors and the God colors in the, this world, and, and as a Holy Spirit person, if I'm trying to take my private faith and make it public, how do I do this without being weird? I think the Apostle Paul shows us a possible way forward. He, he writes to some of the early Christ followers, the early Holy Spirit people, and he gives them very practical advice on how to share their faith. This is Colossians chapter 4. He says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And there it is. Do you see it in there? That one little piece of practical advice on how we should share our faith. Let your conversation, your conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with salt. So if we're going to share our faith as Christ followers, it has to be done through conversation. See, a conversation, it's a two-way street. A conversation signifies real relationship. A conversation, it takes grace and truth. And, and maybe that's what the man with the loudspeaker downtown, maybe that's what he missed. Because on zeal for God, albeit a little misdirected, I give him a 10 out of 10. On effective evangelism strategy, I give him a 0 out of 10. See, he was more interested in condemnation than conversation. Effective evangelism is less about condemnation and more about conversation. See, just as the Apostle Paul tells us, if we're going to practice wisdom when it comes to sharing our faith with outsiders, conversation is the key. So how do we have a wise conversation? Well, a wise conversation is full of grace and seasoned with salt. I want you to picture this cup. This cup represents a conversation with an outsider. And this jug of water, this water represents grace. Grace is patience and understanding and, and empathy and humility that's needed in a wise conversation. This water is grace. And I want you to picture this salt as truth. This salt represents truth. Truth is the holiness of God, the justice of God. Truth is his righteous ways. Truth is the wisdom that, that God has to offer people for right living. Now, we as Holy Spirit people need to have our conversations full of grace and seasoned with salt. So when we have a conversation with someone, we Fill it with grace. Oh, oh, that, now that's a lot of grace in there. You know what? I think, I think we can get a little more grace in there. Oh, I don't know if you can see this at home, but we got some surface tension over the water. This conversation is full of grace. And we just, we just season it with salt. Just, we just season it with salt. Okay, then a little bit, a little bit more. Can you see that? We'll just seize a little bit of salt. We'll just put a little salt bay style. Get it up. Yeah, there we go. Seize, just season it with salt. There we go. That's enough. That's enough salt in there. Now, this conversation is full of grace, just seasoned with salt. We as Holy Spirit people, we season our conversations with salt to bring out the God flavors in this world. 
Now, what happens when I engage in a conversation with an outsider, as I, as I walk around and I, and I rub shoulders with people that don't share the same faith as me, what happens when I disagree with them or, or we come up to a, a stalemate in our theology or our beliefs and we bump up into each other, a little bit of grace might fall out. And I disagree about that and I disagree about this and... And all of a sudden, everywhere I go and I turn to people and I have these real heartfelt conversations with people and I, I spill out grace upon grace upon grace upon grace because my conversation is full of grace and just seasoned with salt. Now, this is how we have wise conversations. But here's the tension. As followers of Christ, what we've done in the past is we have packed our conversations absolutely chock full of salt. Yeah, we put truth in our conversations. We put justice in our conversations. We put the holiness of God in our conversations. We put his wisdom for right living in conversations and we just pack them full. Well, that's not quite full enough because we want people to know the truth about our God. And so we pack it full. That that's not quite full enough. We just we get it full of God's truth and great and 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 justice and vengeance and his wrath. There we go. And we put all of the truth of God in this one conversation. And then we just sprinkle it with grace. <laughs> we just sprinkle it with grace. Just a little bit of grace in there because come on, our Jesus is a savior. And so we sprinkle it with grace, just a little bit of grace. And then we try to have a conversation with someone like this. Does anyone want to have a sip of this conversation? Have you ever tried to eat a mouthful of salt? Talk about hard to swallow. And then what happens when we try to engage with an outsider and we bump up against them and we, and we disagree with them and we, we start to rub shoulders with people that don't believe what we believe. Look what spills out. It's the... The vengeance of God, the wrath of God, the, the holiness of God. And, and we, we, we bump up against these people in real conversations. And it's just salt upon salt upon salt. And no wonder people don't like the taste of followers of Christ all the time. See, not only do we end up turning away outsiders, but perhaps we'll be turning away the next generation of insiders as well. Now, I, I know what you, some of you might be thinking out there. You're thinking, Simon, this is such a cute analogy. I, I, might, even remember this, I might even remember this for a while. Cute, cute analogy, Simon. We're just going to clean up this mess a little bit. You're thinking, okay, Simon, cute analogy, but... What about the holiness of God? What about life-changing truth? What, what about God's justice in this world? I, Simon, I'm not so sure that, that God would endorse this mamby-pamby, anything goes, love first and just turn a blind eye to sin type of grace that you're preaching about. Well, first of all, hear me. There is nothing mamby-pamby about loving first. That's exactly what Jesus did. See, no one is endorsing turning a blind eye towards sin. Just think of the woman who was caught in sexual sin, who was brought before Jesus. Jesus didn't condemn her. He loved her. He said, go, leave your life of sin. In John 8, 11, he says, neither do I condemn you. Jesus declares this over her. He says, now go, leave your life of sin. Jesus, he was, he was full of grace and seasoned with salt. He was full of grace and seasoned with salt. I've heard it said that we as Holy Spirit people, we don't need to go light on doctrine. We just need to go heavy on Jesus. Meaning we can still hold firm to our theological beliefs. We can be unwavering in our understanding of the truth, but we can still lead with love. We're full of grace and we're seasoned with salt. This is what it means to be a walking salt shaker. We just need to shake out enough salt wherever we go to season the world around us and bring out the God flavors. See, our job as Holy Spirit people is not condemnation, but conversation. Okay, I, 
you might be thinking, I don't know, Simon. You want me to go heavy on Jesus? But uh, listen, I'm pretty sure I remember Jesus getting pretty angry with people, like flipping tables angry and, and calling people snakes and whitewashed tombs. And, and you're thinking, okay, I, I'm pretty sure I remember Jesus having some very strong rebukes for people. But all of these rebukes, these were for insiders, not outsiders. In fact, these rebukes, they, they were strong rebukes, but they were for the Pharisees. They were for the, the pastors and the, the teachers and, and the religious elite of the day. See, he, he was talking to pastors. He, he wasn't talking to outsiders. He, he wasn't even talking to you. He, he was talking to me. See, Jesus, Jesus was, was gracious with people that didn't know better. He was tough on people who did know better. So whenever Jesus was having a conversation with an outsider, he was full of grace, full of grace, and just seasoned with salt. In March, I, I, I just recently had the opportunity to go to Israel. The last day of my trip, I was there for 10 days. The last day I got to see the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is an incredible place. It, at its surface, it's 427 meters below sea level. It's the lowest elevation on land anywhere on earth. But what the Dead Sea is best known for is it's dead, okay? It's dead because of the salt content. The salt content in the Dead Sea is 10 times more than the ocean. And because it's so salty, nothing can live in it. Not only can nothing live in it, but people can't sink in it. So, since I'm a man of science, I had to test this for myself. I waded out into the waters of the Dead Sea, and all of a sudden, my feet just kind of like, came up off the ground, and I began just to kind of float in the Dead Sea, vertically, like a giant pool noodle. It was the weirdest, most unnerving experience, just tr like feeling like I'm defying the laws of physics. It was crazy. And then they warned me, make sure you don't get that water in your eyes or in your mouth, because it's just way too salty. But since I'm a man of science, I had to test this for myself. And let me confirm with you, it burns. Oh, how it burns. It's like if you rub your eyes after you're cutting jalapenos, right? Like it just burns so much. See, too much salt is not a good thing. What can be beautiful in these small doses can be just totally ruined in large quantities. We need to be wise in how much salt we are seasoning each conversation with. We can't choke people out by adding too much salt all at once. That just doesn't work. We're supposed to be walking salt shakers, not dumping salt trucks, right? Walking salt shakers. Jesus called us, his Holy Spirit people, to be the salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. Let me tell you why you're here, he says. You're here to be salt seasoning, just the seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. So if we're going to be walking salt shakers, we need to use wise conversation. We need to be full of grace and just seasoned with salt. Which brings me to the big idea for the day. When sharing your faith, lead with love. When sharing your faith, lead with love. See, leading with love can look like having a grace-filled conversation. Leading with love can look like serving the needs of others. Leading with love can look like walking shoulder to shoulder with someone through a very difficult situation. Leading with love can look like building authentic relationships with people who don't share the same faith as you do. Leading with love is effective evangelism 101. I wish all Christ followers around the globe would get on board with this approach in sharing the truth of the gospel, leading with love. And leading with love is, is how you can be spiritual without being weird. So if you want to be spiritual without being weird, it's really quite simple. And this is what we've learned so far. You live with open hands. You live with an open heart. 
and you live as a walking salt shaker. Okay, can I let you in on a little secret? I've been so excited and I've been holding this in this entire series. All the preachers that have gone before me to preach in this series, they wanted to let you in on this connection earlier, but they said, no, we'll save it for Simon, we'll save it for the end. Now, if you've been journeying with us uh, at Broadway for the last couple of weeks, you've journeyed through this series and you might have been thinking to yourself, hmm, something in all of this sounds vaguely familiar. Well, if you're a part of our Broadway community, we, we've developed something here at Broadway called the GROW Principle. The GROW Principle is a roadmap to a guaranteed way to grow in your faith. It, we, we symbolize this with the acronym G-R-O-W, GROW. The G stands for give. Give of your time, your talents, and your treasures. The R stands for read and reflect on Scripture and the Holy Spirit. And the O-W stands for opportunity to witness. So we say every day, somehow, in some way, give of your time, your talents, and your treasure. Read and reflect and take an opportunity to witness and you are guaranteed to grow in your faith. So here's the big reveal. Are you ready? The very same principles that are guaranteed to grow your faith are the very same principles about how to be spiritual without being weird. Right? The G, the give of your time, your talents, and your treasure. That's live with open hands. The, the R, the read and reflect on Scripture and the Holy Spirit. That's live with an open heart. And the OW, the opportunity to witness, is live as a walking salt shaker. So if you do these three things every day, not only are you guaranteed to grow in your faith, but you will be spiritual without being weird. Amazing. Okay, this is my favorite part of the whole series. Perhaps you are here and you know what it's like to be on the receiving end of a condemning loudspeaker in your life. Maybe your whole life you were told that God was angry at you or that he hates you. The truth is, the truth is, God loves you. He's not mad at you. He just simply wants you back. He designed you for good living. He designed you to be in a relationship with him. He has a bright future for you. He has plans for your life. But it all starts with you surrendering your will to his, to lay down your plans for his. See, today, if you've, if you've never put your trust in God before, today you can ask the Holy Spirit to come live within you. Today you can become a Holy Spirit Person. You can turn your back on your old way of living and simply surrender to God. Well, where has that old way of living gotten you anyways? You can surrender to God's embrace and begin to embrace his love and his forgiveness in your life. The love and forgiveness of a God who knows you and, and just simply wants you back. So today, if you've never made this decision to say yes to God before in your life, right now as we close, would you just silently just say this prayer along with me? You can say it in your head. You could bow your, bow your head. You can close your eyes. But just agree with me right now as we close in a word of prayer where we invite God to become our Lord and our Savior from this day forward. Join me right now in prayer as we pray, as we close. Jesus, right now we acknowledge that, that you know me better than I know myself. God, you know all of my faults, all of my failures. And today, I believe that you love me anyway. You have grace and forgiveness for me. And so, Jesus, today, I accept your love and your forgiveness in my life. I turn my back on my old way of living. I don't want to live that way anymore. And Jesus, from this day forward, I will be known as a child of God. I will accept your goodness for me, your plans, your right living for me. And I'll do my best every day to honor you with my life. This is the commitment I make today to you. In Jesus' name, everyone said together, amen, amen. 
Now, if you're watching this and you just prayed that prayer with me, it is the most exciting decision you could ever make to say yes to Jesus for the very first time. There's a number on the screen right now. We have a pastor standing by. You can text that number and we have someone that wants to give you your next best step in a real relationship with the God of the universe. Now, if you are a Holy Spirit person already, you are out there and you consider yourselves a follower of Jesus Christ, be reminded today that you are a living salt shaker. The conversations that you have this week, would God divinely stir in your heart, give you wisdom to know how to fill your conversation with grace and just sprinkle it with salt. Thanks for being with us at Broadway and we'll see you guys next week.